Well, welcome. It is super exciting to be here today with all of you guys. I, I love this event um, because I, I love learning from other leaders. Um, I'll start with my piece of advice. What you've heard about me is vastly overrated, and my advice to you is make sure that you always work with talented, passionate people, because it reflects well on you. Um, <laughs> so that would be that would be my free advice for everybody today. But I'm really excited that people are here, um, and I see a lot of familiar faces and friendly faces and people that I really respect. So I. I can only imagine if we stayed like all day and had pizzas brought in, what we could what we could solve for. <laughs> like I kind of want to do something different, Linda, and just say let's like list the three biggest problems and we can fix those by the end of the day here. <laughs> people we have in this room, so it's great. But wow, we have some super talented people up here for all of us to learn from today. So as a place to start, I, I think Linda gave a little tidbit. But it would be great if each of you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're working on. Is that a good place to start? I always like to hear people's stories from their own perspective. So instead of reading the bio. I guess I'm. Whoever your, wants to start. I told start. them, you can sit in any order. I'm very flexible, whatever. Can, we're, can we're, all, we're all friends here. Is this Go, on? Karen. OK. You, we can hear you. OK, great. So I'm Karen Stanley. I'm the CEO of Caritas. I've been there 18 years. Um, for those of you that may not be as familiar, we are the largest homeless services organization and serve about 4,000 unique individuals a year through our four programs, uh, a healing place for women, uh, and a uh, workforce development program called Works, a furniture bank that helps about 1,000 families a year, and um, the shelter, which is what most people know us through is a congregational shelter. Um, I had to laugh with this topic because the, the, the thing that we're working on now is probably that you know, borderline crazy courageous thing. Um, we're actually taking a 120,000 square foot historic Philip Morris building and doing an adaptive reuse um, that is going to become finally a healing place for women. Um, my administrative offices are gonna be there, the furniture bank, the employment program, and 47 of our own sober living apartments, a $28 million project. And that's, it's happening. <laughs> so, that's what's keeping me busy these days, so. Um, so I've spent the bulk of my career in financial services, although my, uh, my last gig, which I ended up uh, at the end of this past year, was with the uh, largest um, outsourcing company uh, that's based in the U.S. And uh, we had offices in you know, 31 different countries and uh, spent a lot of time on the road with clients and visiting a lot of sites there. But um, started my, uh, uh, I'd say the, the big part of my career, um, somewhat accidentally, with Capital One, uh, actually before it was Capital One. So it was still Signet. And, uh, you know, it was one of those kind of random events. Um, I was, it had somewhat accidentally, I've uh, gotten myself into the credit card industry, <clears throat> and that was because my initial career goal was to be a rock star, uh, which, thank goodness, did not work out, and, uh, and it didn't pay the bills. And so I needed a job. I was in Delaware. It happened to be during that period of time when Delaware was very clever. This was kind of pre-national you know, banking kind of rules, and Delaware was very clever, said, come here, all you credit card companies, and you know, we believe that you can export your, your terms uh, across the entire country. And so there's this big wave and a lot of opportunity. And so I actually got my first uh, job was as a frontline customer service rep. And, uh, you know, I will tell you that I couldn't have had a better start to a career, you know, really being exposed uh, to what happens on the very, very front lines and, and kind of working up from that. But, um, uh, but yeah, so it didn't really work out. I, I was having a bad day at work uh, up in Delaware and the, the phone rang. And you know you get a lot of calls from headhunters and whatnot, but it was a bad day, so I answered this one. And uh, lo and behold, that resulted in my taking a job with Capital One. That resulted in my meeting my uh, my partner for life and um, and my family. And uh, was really you know again kind of accidentally, but one of the most pivotal things. Uh, I did have a wonderful time with um, Wachovia Securities, now Wells Fargo Advisors. I uh, moved over to uh, the UK for a bit and uh, spent some time in London working for Barclays and am now happily back here and I'll say uh, kind of reinventing myself at the moment. Um, you know, left my company 
and am, I don't think I want to kind of go back to the full time, you know, 70 hour a week kind of uh, thing. I'm on one corporate board. We'll be on an advisory board for a, a private equity company, and uh, just trying to figure out what is that next phase of my career look like, both in terms of uh, professionally. Uh, you know, what do I want to spend my time on? But also kind of personally, you know, how do I want to continue to contribute? So, you know, I think these kind of things I hope are part of it. So, Judy, I really appreciate you inviting me here. It's great. Uh, good morning. I'm Liz Dorr. Um, uh, one of the things that drives me is um, helping or businesses that are maximizing the triple bottom line, people, planet, and profit. And so I've had the pleasure for the last several years to work for a small venture capital firm in downtown called NRV that uh, has a $33 million fund and invests in entrepreneurs who start their businesses in Virginia and invest in companies that are doing meaningful things. So we make a lot of invest, we've made a lot of investments in healthcare, healthy food, sustainable energy. My bio is actually a bit dated because as of last week, um, I have had the opportunity for the past six months as part of my job with NRV to work with one of our companies as a fractional CFO and have really loved the work. And so I'm going to jump ship from NRV to um, continue the work with that startup and other startups in the community um, on the fractional advisory uh, side of the business. Um, I also, in my night job, um, serve on the Richmond School Board. Um, and two of my priorities there are um, better budgeting, um, using bringing my financial skills that I have. Um, I'm a numeric person, and it just is what it is. Um, so hoping to, <laughs> helping to bring those skills to the board. And then also, I'm very interested in student health and um, keeping students active, um, healthy food, um, and social and emotional learning standards for kids. And um, also, like three days after I got elected onto the school board, I found out I was pregnant. And so I have an eight month old, so it's been a really busy year. <laughs> um, and uh, I, is this where we say when our fun fact, or is that later? I'm gonna, I'm gonna say my fun fact. Say your fun fact. Um, we'll catch everybody back up. I remember your fun fact from last year, which was really great, so you should probably say it at some point. But um, <laughs> uh, my fun fact is I love animals, and I have a corgi named Lady David Bowie, and I have a cat named Sergeant Pepper. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Ellen Robertson, and I serve on Richmond City Council since 2003. Uh, I represent the 6th District of the City of Richmond, which touches Henrico and Chesterfield County and goes straight through the middle of the City of Richmond. Um, I have uh, enjoyed that tour of duty. It's been quite an experience, being an elected official and being owned by the public, pretty much. Uh, they, we go where they tell us to go, and we do what they tell us to do. Um, it's, uh, it's an experience that I never planned to do. I never thought that I would serve as an elected official. Never been an ambition of mine. But I've found throughout my life that sometimes there are things that uh, plan for you that you don't know what they are, and once. Folk are willing to endorse you and ask you to do something that is as meaningful and powerful as make huge decisions over taxpayers' dollars and make sure that you do everything to try to make sure you're being responsive to them. Um, it depends a lot on not just leading, but the people that are behind you and the folk that are willing to be a part of that team and recognizing that as a leader that um, it takes a lot of giving everyone an opportunity to have a voice in that process. So since I've served on city council, a lot of focus has been on affordable housing. Uh, I also am the uh, patron of the legislation that created the Anti-Poverty Commission for the City of Richmond that we are proud to say now that we have a department, we call it community wealth building rather than poverty because that's our mission and our goal. Uh, spend a lot of time working on issues of equal rights and justice for all. And prior to city council, I did community development. I worked as a, with a nonprofit organization, and we assisted 
350 families to become first home time home buyers uh, in the city of Richmond uh, through the effort of going, actually going to HUD and getting HUD to allow us to use community development block grant funds, which are federal funds, for down payment assistance for qualified buyers. Prior to that, I did some nursing, and um, today I'm looking forward to the next journey of life uh, as we move through the phases of where we move the city forward. Great. Very impressive, right? Wow. Um, okay, I, one thing is, do people have little cards? If you want to write a question, write your question, and Rupa's going to make sure these get picked up periodically. So if you have one as we talk, just raise it, and somebody will come get it from you. Um, and then we'll, we'll get to those at the end, as time permits, OK? Because a lot of times the best questions come, come from, from you guys, not the ones that I thought up with some help from Julie. So great. So we'd love your questions. Um, OK, so Liz already gave us her the thing about her that's not in her bio. Um, since she said I should have meant, I, we had a little switch last, last year. And so Linda was the moderator, and I was kind of the impromptu panelist. And, uh, and I always like this question. My thing is I only wear comfortable shoes. I just gave it up. I just gave it up. I also do not write like lipstick, so I gave that up as well. So it's very empowering. <laughs> so what other fun facts do you guys want to share? We've heard about Liz and her cat and her dog and her baby, which are pretty cool. Um, Marge told she was going to be a rock star. I don't know. She might have more fun facts. What fun facts do you guys have? Yeah, well, my really fun fact right now is um, I recently became a grandmother. And I know. And I did not think this was going to be a role I would fully embrace, right? Because this was kind <laughs> of, um, you know, I'm old. And uh, I found out that I am actually completely capable of making funny sounds and silly faces. <laughs> so, quite proud okay. of it. I, I, I cannot escape this. You know, March telling the story. Um, I, I have two daughters. One's a freshman in college, one's a freshman in high school. My, young, my older daughter, um, at one point, I, I worked, um, and Marge was, was both my manager and my mentor. Um, and so when Maddie was born, we had this event at our house, like, and we had like 40 people over. All the people we worked with, we were having a fun thing. We had a meeting all day and came over. And uh, Maddie was probably like, I don't know, she could hold her head up, so she's six or eight months old. Marge came in, she saw Marge, Marge carried her around the entire evening. She would not let her put her down. So this is actually not surprising to me at all, but I think everybody was kind of like, Marge is all of her manager. She's like our leader. She's walking around with the baby the whole evening. So it was a little surprising. Well, I was originally gonna say that I like to drink bourbon, but then I thought, <laughs> some of you might already know that. So, um, so I decided, um, the thing you probably don't know is that I was actually a, um, a police officer in Wyoming before I moved here. Who knew? Can you imagine if we were drinking bourbon, the stories we got? Fraser. <laughs> so I guess something that no one would know about me is that I was one of the first African Americans to be a model in the Mill and Rose Tea room. Isn't that wonderful? Awesome. Isn't that awesome? And so I, for a long time, did a lot of modeling and uh, fashion and, you know, just throwing different things together to make them work. So that's a real specialty awesome. of mine. I love doing that. All right. Those, now I feel like we really know the panelists. <laughs> um, so our theme for today is leading with courage. So when you guys... I, Anybody wants to answer? When you heard this, like, what came to mind for you? And do you have an example of courage bringing you success? And any, it, it certainly sounded like that from your interest. I'll take that one. I, I, I had to laugh when I saw the topic because of this this project, and um, I, I have a tendency to be, be not at all risk averse. So, I, I mean, I just, I am a risk taker, and I was kind of looking up what the opposite of that was, and it said courageous, and I said, oh, okay, that works. No, because I think this, this project is just so 
big and something that I never anticipated taking on, and I've learned so much about that. Um, that was, uh, that's why it felt good to me to be part of this. Yeah, I, um, you know, there was actually a very specific event that came to mind when I first read the description here, and it actually happened here at um, Capital One. And, uh, uh, you know, one of the many wonderful experiences that uh, helped me grow here. But it was pretty early on, and it was kind of a crazy time. I mean, you were one of the first folks uh, here as well, and um, we had a lot to do in a very short window of time. We were growing like crazy, and um, you know things had to be done. And so I was really, I was having a really hard time, quite honestly, um, and found myself kind of dropping back into very kind of directive behavior in order to kind of get done what I thought needed to be done. And I was quite honestly struggling. And so I was uh, talking with my boss, uh, Nigel Morris, and um, he said, you know, in order for people to follow you, they have to know you, right? And in order for them to know you, you have to be who you are. And you know, one of the things I am is I'm a lesbian. And you know, it's definitely. I, I, I was. I moved to the south for goodness' sakes, right? I mean, this is below the Mason-Dixon line. I'm not, you know, going to be particularly forthcoming about this, and and I wasn't. And it was this this huge barrier, right? That I think actually did prevent folks from trusting me, right? In order to trust me, they needed to know me, and um, so you know, with his uh, encouragement, I just kind of, you know, it wasn't this big grand announcement or anything like that, but just started kind of showing up with my, my whole self, right? If I had something to, to say about my family, they talked about my family. Uh, you know, if we wanted to go to public events and nonprofit events, we went together. And so uh, that made all the difference, right? I think it really did allow me to make connections with people uh, that I think did build that, 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 that feeling of trust. Um, but it was scary. It was actually downright scary. I was not sure. I appreciated that I had this rock solid guy as my boss. And I will tell you, you know, if you have an opportunity to be that for people, it matters. Um, but still, you know, making that choice and kind of following through then consistently on that uh, was, was a pretty scary thing, but made all the difference uh, in the world. Great. Going down the line. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to go, if not, we'll just go to the next question. Tell. Um, I mean, I don't know if my courageous story is anywhere near what the prior two panelists um, uh, mentioned. Um, I think one thing that is can be challenging and um, rewarding is um, learning when to push the envelope and when to question and how to do it. Um, one of the things that I've been focused on. Um, and my job at NRV is um, increasing. There's a huge problem on the supply side about um, female, the sort of underrepresentation of female entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs, uh, minority entrepreneurs in general. Um, and then on the investor side, it um, is a compounding problem because less than 10% of investors in private equity are women. And um, to me, I feel like um, as investors, I looked around at our investor pool and of our 50 investors, we had two women and zero people of color. Um, and so, um, and I worked for for white men who are lovely and I, they're awesome, but um, you know, it's hard as a 30 year old to bring up that challenge and that issue to your place of business. Um, but I think if, I think being authentic and being genuine about it um, was really successful and was one of the, the best things, in my opinion, one of the things I'm most proud of at NRV and I think one of the things that the firm is most proud of. Um, so through that work, I, I asked my bosses if I could organize an event to target female investors, um, educate them about what it's like to invest in the space. My goal was to have 25 women attend, 80 showed up. I was invited to Hampton Roads to do the same thing and we had 120 women show up. Awesome. Um, we now have an above average, it's not 50%, but it's not 2%, <laughs> um, above average number of women investing with NRV and an above average number of um, minorities investing with NRV. Um, and um, 
and my bosses at our first event actually um, offered to be the waiters um, <laughs> for all the women. So, um, so I think it was nerve wracking to bring it up, but I think um, I think it was ultimately successful. And I think having the courage to push the envelope, but do it in a respectful way, and um, can be really, um, really amazing. And it was funny, a couple of months after we started this initiative, um, some, a reporter from Style Weekly called and said, ah, oh, NRV, you're only, you know, you're just white men making investments. And um, she was looking, fishing for a story. And um, we actually had a lot to talk about that um, refuted what her original thesis was. Um, so, um, yeah. Nice. Great. Wow. That's a nice story. <laughs> I think one of the greatest challenges that I faced in when, when this subject matter came up on carriage, um, I moved to a neighborhood um, in 1984, 85, something like that. And I uh, was going to school at VCU, working on my degree in urban studies and planning, and working full time as a intensive care nurse. And so, going to school, working, just got married, didn't have time to do anything but come home and scrape paint on an old house that we just purchased that I loved. And one day I was just tired of it all and I decided, you know what, I'm sick of all of this. And I got on my bicycle and went for a ride through the community. And as I rode through the community, I began to question where was I and where, where was I living? Because I really hadn't, I wasn't smart enough to buy a community and buy a house in it. I bought a house and didn't think about the community. And um, so as I rode my bicycle, I went by blighted business area, little community quarters that had been abandoned. And I rode and more blighted houses. And, you know, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, where in the world am I? I'm a little fret right in where I know is still within a bicycle ride of where I live. And I keep thinking, oh, I'm just going through a spot. It's going to change. And you know, I was studying urban planning. So I thought, oh, this is just you know, putting the real work to where I live. And um, so I got to the end of the community, and I turned around. And I was so devastated that I could barely see from the tears that were falling down my face as to where in the world was I living. And there was a senior citizen sitting on her front porch. And I stopped and I said, would you tell me about this place, what community this is, and what's going on here? And so she told me all of the stories about you know, what it used to be when she first moved in, how it was such a beautiful community, and how it had gone through its transition of white flight in um, rental housing, uh, rooming houses, abandonment, and blight. And she said, I can see that this is very disturbing to you. And I said, it is extremely disturbing to me. And I am heartbroken that I'm living here. And she said, well, let me tell you something, little lady. God put you here for a purpose. And now that you're here, you need to roll up your sleeves and figure out how you're going to have, fix this community to be the place that we bought it when we moved in. So I get on my bicycle and I'm crying even more now because now all of a sudden this lady expects me to fix all of this stuff that I had absolutely nothing to do with and I don't know how to even think about doing that. So I'm riding home and I go over to my neighbors who's a realtor and I go on the porch and I said, listen, put my house on the market, I'm out of here, sell it, I am gone. He said, okay, I'll do that. Uh, he said, but one question. After a long conversation, let me cry and cry and cry. He said, who deserves to live here if you don't, Ellen? And every time I remind myself of that, I still feel that cut. And I looked at him and I said, from you and the little old lady all the way down at the end of the community, if you're willing to sit at the table with me and figure it out, I'll stay till we fix this community. 
but put my house on the market because it's not going to take us long. We're going to get this done and I'm going to be finished. I still live in the community. And it is the community that we formed a nonprofit organization and was successful in going up to Washington and getting HUD to allow us to use down payment, uh, federal funds for down payment for first time qualified bankers. And, and since that time, we've been building the community. And it is like Richmond, I think it has turned the bend in the curve. And I think this time, it is on its way for real sustainable success. And our greatest challenge today is that we want to make sure that it remains economic inclusive and that we don't move from one type of situation to exclude again. So that's my real, that was uh, years <laughs> of battling, but with great success. Did you stay in the same house? Actually, I moved in. When I first moved, I moved on Carolina, and I was on the, in the middle of the 3200 block of Carolina, and I moved around the corner, and now I'm in the 3200 block of Inslow. <laughs> um, I have to just say, like, we plan, and you think about who would be great people to hear from and what would be a great theme. Like, I have to say, this was pretty remarkable. So I don't, I don't know how you guys are feeling, but I'm like, wow. Like, if I'd said, like, could you make up, like, four perfect stories? And I'm, I have to tell you right now, I'm a little bit like, wow. I, I don't actually know what to say next, because that was, that, those were incredible. Thank you for sharing those. That was very impactful, at least for me. So, that's great. Wow. Um, so, so kind of our other theme, you know, under leading with courage, we, we did, you know, I mean, like between Wonder Woman and Black Panther and the whole Marvel franchise, which one of my kids is obsessed with at this moment, um, I, I will say, you know, we did have to talk about superpowers. So we just heard some incredible stories of courage. Tell me, wh what would each of you say is your leadership superpower? Uh, whoever, like we don't have to go in order. Most about this question. <laughs> um, uh, um, I, I think one of my strengths is um, it's one of my strengths and one of my weaknesses. Actually, um, I have a. Um, I've been described as someone that has quote an extreme propensity to get stuff done, <laughs> um, which is great because I think it um, enables. I'm very driven and I'm. Um, I'm, I can be quick, um, and I want things to be done quickly, um, which has enabled me to um, start some things and have some success. I think um, on the challenging side, especially um, it's been challenging as an elected official because the pace of policy change in government is slower than I want. <laughs> <laughs> as you very well know. Um, and if you don't, I've learned some difficult lessons in my first year in office. Um, if you don't take the time to bring the community along and bring your colleagues along, you can be unsuccessful. And so um, there were, I had came into the office with all these big ideas and I wanted to get them done in two months. Um, and um, maybe did not take the time in the beginning to um, build the relationships and bring the community along with me. And so, um, so anyways, that said, I'm not gonna abandon my ability to, or my drive to, um, to make that stuff happen. So, um, but yeah. I, I, I would say that, you know, I, I deal a lot in areas that are tough stuff for people to accept. And I have the ability, I've been gifted with the ability to bring people into a room around conversations that are difficult to have, but help them to be comfortable with that, to be very comfortable with that. Um, I was speaking with someone earlier this morning about the Confederate uh, monuments and so forth. And, you know, that's a difficult conversation to have. Um, and people's opinions vary across the spectrum. 
Um, but I think what, I, what I'm able to do is to um, give people that space that they can be comfortable with being who you are and share your opinions um, and know that you are entitled to your opinions and that there's space for everyone to be able to have those opinions. And collectively, we find a way that there's a common thread and that we can reach that. And um, that has proven to have been extremely effective for me as we work in this political arena where everyone have a right to an opinion and they should have the opportunity to express their opinion. And uh, I've learned so much in that process, and I have become able to better appreciate the beauty in us all, even those that I completely disagree with. And I, I, um, I guess I would say mine is about building teams of sorts. And it actually you know, involves, I think, a lot of the same kind of behaviors and activities that both of you guys talk about because um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely a believer that you, you, know, and you, you can't really do anything great by yourself. Right? Almost by definition, you don't scale. Right? You have to have other people, other capabilities in order for that to happen. So being able to kind of bring those different viewpoints together, those different talents together, those different styles together, and you know, create a sum of the parts that is definitely uh, much greater. The, the whole is much greater, right, than the than the sum of those parts. Uh, I think I've been fortunate to, you know, have great people, Judy, as you were referencing before, to to work with and able to do that. But um, have really tried to build up the the capability to to get people to have those conversations, right? To identify what is special, what is great that that person is bringing to the table, and how can we make sure that that can be unleashed uh, in a way that really can create results. This is what one of the hardest questions for me. I don't know if you, about you guys, but I have a really hard time discerning what my own superpower is. So I actually had to go to a couple of my staff and to a good friend of mine that was a leadership coach just to get their thoughts because I really, you know, what I think isn't necessarily what comes across. So I think I got very different answers from all of them, but I think the common thread for me um, is compassion. And I'll tell you why, and it's my gift and my curse, because if you do my Myers-Briggs, I'm kind of borderline E-N, I'm an E-N-F-J. And I'm like an F for feeler, all, as far as it goes. Um, which makes it difficult for me, because in what I do, and you see the pain of the people that we serve, that are folks that are struggling with homelessness, and even worse through this opioid epidemic with people that are dying because of this disease. And we have a death board in the healing place that I probably know 50 men by name on there now. But the good thing is that it's also, that's what drives me to do to, you know, we don't look at whose feelings are being hurt by conversations and who's you know, we, we do what needs to be done and we go beyond and we just take it and we know that this is the right thing to do um, for our community and just continue to move forward. And I think that, in, and then in that piece, there's also, you know, I'm, I'm very accessible to my staff. My staff knows I've got their back. Um, but we just, I, I can build relationships because of that compassion. And that, I think that's my, that's my superpower. Those were impressive. I, I would encourage everybody today to take five minutes from your account, from your like busy life, and think about what's your superpower. You probably have more than one, but I, I think the other thing that you heard on this is, um, and, and this has been my experience with a lot of people I have met at the Y who at YW who I have great respect for, is they're all very humble. But we all need to feel like we know what we're good at. And so I would encourage everybody to think about it because it's a very interesting question. And I've had the same, as we were prepping for this, like my impression of what mine was and what somebody else's impression were, were different things and it caused me to think about it. So the issue is all of you probably have many. So you can have a long list too at the end of the day if you want that. Thank you guys for sharing, those were great. Um, so some of you referenced people that you work with. Um, 
And um, it, it, tell me about, along your journey, people who have been great role models for you. It's somebody you really, like this is some, because that's kind of what we're doing today is learning from all of you. What's your perspective on someone that you found was a role model for you? Anybody? Yeah, I'll start with this one. So, um, and I have been really, really fortunate. I mean, just completely fortunate to be exposed to some uh, extremely both good people, but also very talented people. And, you know, it's not a, a single person, right, that was kind of a mentor across all dimensions. It's really, again, been identifying what is that person, like, amazing at that I'm not, and you know, how do I how do I learn from them? So, you know, I'll give you just a couple of examples. One, going back to my Capital One days, was was Nigel, right? And this is a guy who taught me the power of and. Okay. I am kind of by nature, I'm an operator, right? I'm about execution, I'm about getting things done. I am risk averse. Um, and uh, you know, my, my my first word is 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 but, right? Not and. It's or or but. And so, you know, his big thing was to teach you the power of and, right? You don't have to discard that thing that comes natural to you. You don't have to discard that thing that actually does work, but you can put the and in front of it. So that was big time powerful. I had, uh, when I was at Arcovia Securities, completely different environment, right? Retail brokerage firm, all about the client. Uh, my boss there uh, was the CEO, Danny Ludeman, the best relationship guy I have ever met in my life. He could walk into a room of 200 people and go person by person, know their name, never looked at a badge, right? Knew their family, didn't spend his time looking over their shoulder for the more important person, but, you know, completely engaged. And I was just, like, I was amazed, right, at, at just the ability to just be so good at, uh, at building relationships with this in that way. And then the last one I'll note, when I was at Barclays, I had this woman, uh, Val Serrano Keating, and um, she was the most competitive person I've ever met in my life. She scared me uh, in many ways. Um, but, and, and I had been, again, kind of blessed in a way to generally be in environments that are, were more kind of a meritocracy, so you didn't have to kind of compete, right, in that somewhat sharp elbowed way. But guess what? Not every place is like that. Not every, you know, uh, 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 arena as you guys can, I'm sure, uh, very well uh, attest to, uh, is like that. So being able to watch her and learn something you know, that I didn't want to learn even, um, but is important to have access to from time to time, uh, just hugely valuable. So I've had some, had some really great mentors. I would say that probably many of you know the couple people in my life that have been mentors. Wally Statenius, we go back to, um, he was the, Caritas was the first organization that he worked with when he retired from Cadmus. And I was actually on the board back in the late 90s um, when I first got to meet him. And he's still, to this day, when I have one of my crazy harebrained ideas, I get it vetted out as much as I can, and I go take it to him, and he helps throw darts at it and ask questions that I know I'm going to need to have answered before I bring it to anybody else to look at. But there was a, there's one special lady, too, that I also met early in my time with Caritas that... I just reconnected with last week. And how many of you guys know Marsha Penn? A few of you. Well, Marsha Penn is a badass. <laughs> she just, there's just no other way I can say that anything about her. She is a lovely lady. She's 78 years old. I don't think she'd mind me telling you that. I think it's on Facebook. But she just, she's, um, she's a Jewish lady. She just moved back here from New York City. Um, but I took my very first class from her when I was becoming the incoming chair at Caritas, and it was defining the, the um, incoming um, board chair and the executive director relationship. And then when I was with The Healing Place, I was actually bored there. I did the no-no twice before I became staff. And um, in between, when I rolled off the board there, and it was such a dysfunctional board, um, I remember Tom Cunningham telling me that, yeah, we hired this. He called her that. He said, we hired this badass, Marsha Penn. She's come in and she's straightened us out. But she is, she's just so bold in asking you these questions. And she did it to me Friday, about brought me to my knees, that you just have to answer. And she's just so, she goes right to the core of the issue. Um, 
and just really makes you think of things in a different way. And I just, I found her to be, I, I told her Friday, I said, gosh, I've missed you. She'd been in New York for five years. I had not seen her, hadn't spoken to her in a while. But she just brought me right back to the, to the, the Marsha Penn, the reason I, that I loved her. She's just very, a very interesting woman. So it's very, it's really important to have people like that that really push you and really ask questions that are painful but that you need to think of in your life. Um, at NRV, um, when I was first uh, looking for a new, I was living in Florida and I was looking to come back to Richmond and I knew um, Jim Ucrop and Bob Mooney, two of the three founders of NRV, because um, I'm a William Mary total crazy person and love the alumni there. And they said, hey Liz, um, we're doing this thing with startups, why don't you come join us? And I literally knew nothing about startup world or venture capital, private equity, but um, I knew that they were good people and um, quite frankly, if they had asked me to come and clean their houses for a living, I knew that it would probably be a good decision. And so I took a leap and I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. Ted Chandler, their third partner, um, all three of them um, have a distinct way of infusing their community commitment with their work. And um, I don't think I would have run for a school board had I not been in an environment that both um, inspired me to be better at practicing my craft and finance and being a better um, employee, but also about thinking about my role intentionally in the community. So one of the um, landmarks of the folks at NRV is um, if you sit for a day in the office, you will see um, a whole sling, a slew of people that may or may not have anything to do with startups. <laughs> um, and everyone there will take a meeting with anyone um, and try and help them or um, listen to their story or try and connect them with a job opportunity or hopefully invest in them. Um, and I, I've learned so much from the three of them in um, how to be um, both uh, good at your job, but also um, how to think more broadly about your role in the community. And I'm really grateful to the three of them for that. This is a difficult question for me to answer. I have had so many, so many folk that, uh, that have contributed to who I am today. Um, and it goes from my pastor, who's always there to guide me and make me walk the straight and narrow and remind me of the importance of integrity and um, not allowing me to say, well, may not be right, but deserving and remind me of who's to make those kind of decisions. Um, my mother has certainly been a huge influence in my life. Uh, she has taught me the values of how to pinch a penny and to pinch it again <laughs> and be satisfied with pinching it. Um, I know when I was at VCU, uh, John Meeser, which I'm sure lots of you all know, uh, he became my just model professional. I mean, he was just such a great inspiration as for as getting you through the tough school work that had to be done while working full time everywhere and doing all the other things that I was doing. But um, and his dedication and commitment to community and equality and all of these kinds of things that meant a lot to me. Um, but I would say that, you know, the one person that has challenged me the most in my life is my husband. <laughs> all right. Well, moving on. That was great. Thank you, guys. <laughs> See, you kind of need that, right? We're all like, oh. um, thank you, guys. That was awesome. Um, so I'd like to turn the topic a little and get whoever has a perspective. Um, I mean, we are here in an event for the YWCA around our Outstanding Women Award Month. 
Um, which, by the way, I, I think one of the most remarkable things is that the YWCA has uh, been recognizing women leaders since 1980. Like, I, just think for a minute. People just didn't do that then. So it's pretty remarkable um, to think about that. So I'm kind of interested in people's perspective, whoever has one, about like what do we think the biggest issues facing women leaders are today? Any thoughts about that and what they're saying that's working or maybe yeah, not I, working? I'll start You're off excited with one. to answer yeah, that I, question. I, I am actually. I can tell. And it's it's I just I read an article the other day that um, uh, yeah, I've read several before, unfortunately, right? And this was the latest one. So here's one thing that I think, and that is I think women leaders have got to get a realistic assessment of their capabilities, which, by the way, is a lot greater than I think most folks really internalize. And it was this article that said that if uh, it, was a, it was a study done. I think it was a Harvard study. Uh, but in any case, three times as many men said that they were better than their counterparts, than women, right? Three times. And we know that it matters, right? We, because we still have not gotten that far in terms of the wage differential. That still is huge. You know, it depends on which particular one you look at, but 78 cents on a dollar, right? Still, in this country, only 22% of senior management roles are held by women, still. And so it matters, and I think part of what happens is that you know, and uh, is is we we don't internalize our greatness, right? We all said that that superpower question was hard, and it was. But I think that's part of what we have to do is realize how you rock, and you do, and be figure out a way, right, to activate that, um, so that we really indeed do get that fair recognition and wage, and opportunity, the whole nine yards. I thought Linda was going to stand up there and start yeah. cheering. I can't believe you raised that. Today is National I Wage just Equity say Day. That. All right. Yeah. There you go. Great. It's important. All right. Hard to follow. Anybody else have a thought about that? <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> So, so for, I mean, you all are, are very strong women leaders. What's made a difference for you, do you think, in your careers? Anybody have a thought about that? I think, you know, what's made a difference for me is I've always been driven by purpose. Um, I've enjoyed every career I've experienced in my life. I've not had a job that I didn't fully enjoy. Every job that I've had, I look forward to getting up in the morning and doing it. And folk will ask me frequently as elected official serving on Richmond City Council with everybody saying, oh, I saw you last night on TV. Um, <laughs> I like what I do. I really, really do. And I've never had a job that I predetermined that this is the job that I want to do. And I've always been asked to do the jobs that I've gone to do. And I've always been apprehensive about, oh, goodness, what am I getting myself into? Um, but it's amazing how those career opportunities have afforded me a opportunity to learn a lot and experience a lot. And because I didn't have a ambition as to where I'm going to go next in those jobs, I've enjoyed every step of the journey. And the journey has taken me to places that I would have never planned for myself. And I've always found that there has been an abundance of people that are there to help me through that process. And so in those spaces where I have felt not capable and ready to do those things, there's always been folk that were just as dedicated and committed to the mission 
that there's always been an abundance of resources and talents that are there. And, and I would say as it relates to being a woman that, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't, I, I, I am not in competition with no man. <laughs> I'm okay being a woman. And I love what I do. And, and I feel very empowered that I have the capacity and the ability to do everything that I need to do. Now, if I can't get the top off of the water bottle, and there's a guy sitting next to me, I always ask him to open it for me. <laughs> Um, I can relate to, to some of what Ellen was saying. I, I think um, I, um, I've actually never, all, of all of my jobs, I've never applied for any of them. Um, and they've been, they make sense to me in my brain, but if you look at my resume, I look kind of schizophrenic. Uh, um, so um, anything from driving around the country on a veggie oil bus doing environmental justice work, to working in politics, to working in corporate America for the railroads, to working in venture capital. Um, but uh, I've been driven by um, kind of seeing opportunity where maybe others might not necessarily see the opportunity and by interesting, I think I'm a pretty intellectually curious person and so, um, you know, not being afraid to enter into a new industry or take on a new risk and really make the most of it. So I think um, I think that's what's sort of driven some of my um, my early success. I would say similar similarly to to Liz. Um, if you look at my resume, it's the same thing. I put, had a radio TV sales. Um, degree in college to think that that doesn't correlate typically to what you do in homeless services but um, <laughs> but I've just you know my, my dad and we talk about the mentor thing too he's not doesn't have a lot of the capacity to help me that he used to but he was always my biggest cheerleader and my biggest sounding board and I remember I was a you know he hated when I became a police officer because I was the only female going through the class you know I'd never shot a gun before and here I was you know doing all these these, these guy things, I was clearing buildings, and he just was really flipped out about that. And then I went to work for a police department, and you know, I say this, um, there were, I lit, worked in Chesterfield Police as a, as a civilian, but living as a female, a strong female, not from the South, in, a, in Bubbaville, was a real, <laughs> a real challenge for me. It, um, I very much learned the mantra to ask for forgiveness, not permission, because I got a heck of a lot more done. Um, but every, if I look at the steps that I took, you know, I learned, I became a police officer. I had the background in sales, and then I got into nonprofit. So I've done the, you know, the, the for profit, the public service, and then the nonprofit. Everything played a role in the role that I play today. I mean, from being able to look at, you know, the biggest problem client that we've ever had who's spent 30 years in prison for murder, and to be able to not be, you know, to be able to have an eye-to-eye -eye conversation and have mutual respect with that person. I mean, everything that I've done, and, and, and my dad told me, and, you know, I, I just know this in my heart, it's like, you know, you're, we're not in control completely of our journey. And sometimes you feel like you're taking some illogical steps that are really logical steps to take you where you need to be. And um, I never in a million years thought I'd be working on a project like this. And I'm like, you know, maybe this is a ste step to the next phase in my journey, who knows? But I'm just, I enjoy every day like the rest of you in what I do and um, it's just part of my story, so. Yeah, and I'll just pile on a little bit to the notion of um, leading with purpose. And um, you know, it makes me think of, uh, again, harken back to a Capital One story. Um, had uh, a big team meeting, and um, you know, we, were, we were talking about, I don't know what we were talking about, variety of things. Um, but, uh, but it was good open discussion, and I remember uh, this one woman uh, spoke up, and she said, yeah, but like, what's our purpose? I, I don't feel good about our purpose. All, we sell credit cards, right? We, we put people in debt, we sell credit cards, right? And so, so one, this is healthy to have that kind of open discussion, uh, especially if somebody's kind of um, uh, concerned about it. And, but you know, as the discussion ensued, it became really clear that we had a huge purpose, 
a huge purpose that, you know, treating customers well and providing them with good products and services, hey, that's nothing to sneeze at. That is an important part of our overall environment. But probably even more important was the fact that we were successful, we were growing, we were creating jobs. We were creating a healthy environment, right, where people could show up and be themselves, who could work hard and get rewarded for it, uh, who then had the, the, the capacity to be able to, you know, buy homes, send kids to school, do all those things uh, that many of us, you know, can take for granted and, and many of us couldn't. And so I just, you know, I, I always want to encourage business people to never minimalize what you do, right, and how important and how impactful you can be. Uh, you know, if you create an environment and treat one person well where they feel cared about, they feel respected, they feel valued, you know, they go home and they interact with four other people and they're going to interact in a different way and those people are going to interact with more people, et cetera. It really has this compounding effect that is amazing. And I think that, you know, we just have to recognize, yeah, we call it business, but we can make it something that is much, much more profound and impactful. Great. All right, so I'm gonna turn a little bit. Um, you know, we kind of, I think most people would say we live in a little bit of a negative cycle at this point. Um, though I actually know three people, oddly enough, who like are futurists. I mean, this sounds like a pretty good gig if you can get it, by the way. Um, and I met one of them recently, and, and this person is very optimistic. And his point is, hey, here's the reason you hear so much negative. Because you're 10 times more likely to remember that than something positive. And so the people that are selling you ads and making money in their, in their whatever they do are telling you negative things because then they get your eyeballs and your brain space. So it's an like, interesting thing to know. But, there, but his point is there's a lot to be optimistic about the future. And, and frankly, if I think about the three people I know that are futurists, they're all really optimistic to the point that you're kind of like, really? Um, and um, so I guess my, my question to you guys is, like, how are you thinking about the future? Like, what are you excited about? And are you doing it? What are you doing to get prepared for it? I'll, I'll start. Um, so one of the things I'm actually really excited about is the amount of, or the number of women who are entering into um, elected politics, right? This has been an area, again, that kind of, I don't want to compete in that like kind of really overt type of way, which I don't think there's anything more overt in terms of competitiveness than, than uh, trying to be elected. And that really gets me excited and really gives me a sense of hope and optimism. And, um, you know, I applaud all of those folks who do it. I don't know, talk about leading with courage. I don't know that I have the courage, right, to, to go down that path. Uh, but I completely respect those who do and uh, encourage anybody here who's got an inkling to really think about it because that's going to be how we're going to make a big difference. I would say just the, seeing the, what's happened since the shooting in Florida and the younger generation too. I don't know about you guys, but I didn't have the highest hope for the next generation of the millennials for a while. Um, you, know, you, you see twinklings of it, and you see these powerful young ladies up here, but overall, there's, it was a lot of uh, self-absorption, it felt like, and then to see just this, the power that's come out from Florida with these kids and the march, and you know, I'm really hopeful about the younger generation and what's, what's gonna happen, and that, they're the ones that are going to change the world, and you guys, you ladies, are going to be leading that charge, and we're excited about it. So our, our generation hasn't done as much as we'd sure like to do. All right. Um, another thing about the future, and, and even the current state, that might be interesting to get in somebody's perspective on is pace of change, right? It does feel like change happens at increasing frequency, right? Um, and, and you hear people talk about, wow, there's just the pace of change. You know, I got to update all my apps, right? I got the new OIS. I heard somebody like ranting on the new OIS. I'm like, I, I just think this is a skill we're all going to have to get used to, people. It's, like, it's great new features, yay, and it's also bug fixes. It's just going to happen periodically. So um, I, I guess my question is, how do you all manage change? Anybody have a great change tip? Bourbon. <laughs> I think we're seeing a theme with Karen. Uh -huh. Um, I, 
personally love change. Um, I, I think it's one of the great pleasures of life is doing something new and seeing something new and experiencing something new. Um, I think on the technology front, um, sometimes I get a little bit like we got the you know Alexa speaker and then I was like, oh, is it listening to all of our conversations? And <laughs> it's a little scary. Um, but uh, you know, if you look back and you read early news reporting about the emergence of the telephone and the telegraph and the TV, society has always been scared of technological innovation. And um, working in the startup world, you get to see how um, technology can really um, disrupt entrenched markets and um, increase access to people. Um, this one awesome entrepreneur that I met recently has built a financial literacy app for um, uh, low-income communities, and it's a gamification, and it had a record number of app downloads in the first week because she's really figured out a way to communicate and use technology to reach um, people that might not have had the access to that type of um, financial literacy programming. So I think it's I think it's really exciting, um, and I think um, I think on a public policy perspective, it's challenging because um, I think. Uh, I'll just speak from the education world. Um, there have been changes in education policy over the past 15, 20 years that maybe have not been great, right? So um, the sort of over-reliance on standardized testing, um, te you know, teaching it, sort of being so um, dogmatic about what teachers have to teach and not enabling them to have the creativity to um, not teach to the test and um, you know more focus on memorization as opposed to critical thinking, et cetera. Um, and so I think in the education world, rightfully so, um, folks are scared of innovation and change because there's been a lot of crappy change. Um, that doesn't mean from where I sit that we don't need change, um, but it can be challenging to sort of um, think about change in a good and bad way and 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 so still push ourselves to innovate and be different and push the envelope, but also recognize some of the mistakes of the past. I would say in all seriousness, I mean, you know, when you look at managing change in your smaller world, in your environment, I think it's just, it's acknowledging that it's happening, it's celebrating the successes and continuing that forward movement. So I, I know I, one of my personal issues that I learned in a 360 evaluation was that um, I'm so far ahead of my staff. Usually, like I'm on to the next project and leaving my staff in the dust to, to <laughs> clean up the mess that, that we've created by moving on. So it's it's taken me an I've taken the opportunity to to be very intentional about. Um, celebrating and, and kind of wrapping up one thing before we move on to the next. And it's been help, it's helped as an organization to uh, manage m me <laughs> and um, my vision, but and keeping my, my staff in the loop and, and uh, allowing us to, to celebrate together when we have successes. Yeah, I would agree with the celebration part a lot. And that actually makes me think of the whole, I, I, folks here I'm sure are uh, familiar with uh, all the stages of grief right, then the translation of that model into stages of change, right? And I guess, you know, the one thing that uh, I think as leaders sometimes we don't recognize is that, like, we've got to go through all of those stages as well, right? So many times as leaders, we're supposed to, we're just supposed to be okay with everything. And we're supposed to immediately show up already adapted to the new reality and already embracing it. You know, we got to go through all those changes. You can't skip but you gotta go through them faster, right? That is part of being a leader. Give yourself the recognition and understanding and permission to feel all those things and go through them, but go through them faster, because you got a team that you gotta help get through it as well. Good. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have a couple questions. Rup is handing me questions. So we're gonna do these rapid fire too, okay? So everybody doesn't have to answer everyone, all right? What's the most surprising thing that happened in your in your rise in your leadership journey? Anybody got something? What's the most surprising thing that happened in your rise to leadership? Yeah. 
It was all perfectly planned. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll chime in with one. So in, in very business oriented. But I had the opportunity to be the co-CIO here at Capital One, which um, uh, <laughs> absolutely was surprising. Um, <laughs> and and it was it was all because I was, I think, the biggest yeah user of technology. But I think I was the biggest complainer <laughs> about technology. And so it was a bit of fine. You take it. And, um, but that ended up actually being a pretty fundamental addition to my skill set, and I think, again, kind of helped me kind of get on, a, on, a, on an even more upward trajectory. Um, I won my election. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I won my election in the year that Trump won. I am a big liberal Democrat, and my district is 50 Democrat, 50 Republican, and I won two to one. So against a Republican nice. from Richmond. Um, so I was surprised. <laughs> uh, I worked my ass off, but, um, but I was surprised, especially in the political climate that we had um, last year. So I guess I found out that you know, I had never, before I came to Caritas, I was always in a job where it was a one-man band. I was a salesperson. I was a domestic violence coordinator for the police department. So it was, uh, I didn't have a staff to work with. And I guess I realized that I'm very intuitive and am good at, good at being a leader. And I didn't know that because I didn't ever have the opportunity to, to try it. And I remember going to, when we won the Bank of America Neighborhood Builders Award, you go through leadership um, training around the country. And I remember um, going through some of those trainings and going, oh, that's what they call it. It's like I knew what I did, but I didn't know there was a term for it and there was actually all the statistics around it. It was just very much intuitive for me. So I think that was a surprise that I just um, had the, some natural abilities to, to step in, into that role. Okay, here's a little bit of a different question. Um, I'm going to try to kind of put two together because I'm trying to be mindful of people's very valuable time. Um, so you guys have some very compelling stories that turned out well. Like you were courageous, you were very successful. Anybody want to share something that didn't work out well? It's all been success the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I have a funny story but where that risk aversion or the lack of risk aversion it kind of bit me. Um, I was asked to be on a panel, funny, um, for a vulnerable populations um, conference. And it was being um, sponsored, co-sponsored by the Department of Be Behavioral Health and Developmental Services. So I remember getting on a phone call, very similar to the one we did the other day, where we introduced each other, kind of talked about who was going to do what. And I started off foot and mouth um, by saying something. Like, you know, it's really ironic that DBHDS is sponsoring this, and they've asked me to be part of it. Because honestly, DBHDS doesn't recognize anything we do at the healing places be being valuable. So we kind of get around the room, and then we get to the facilitator who happens to be from DBHDS. It's like, oh, good. But the good thing that came out of it was the next, that day, I had a call from the Secretary of Health and Human Resources office, and we ended up getting a meeting together, and things ended up turning out okay. But it was at that moment, that little sphincter moment where you go, oops, probably shouldn't have said that, but anyway. I think um, I'm not afraid to um, sort of point out what I think and um, get involved in the fight. And um, sometimes I have um, picked the wrong fight or um, sort of gotten too in the, the weeds of a, a battle that doesn't actually really matter. Um, to me, the stakes are really high, and so I get very passionate about things. Um, and sometimes, upon reflection, it's like, eh, I probably didn't need to like be that intense about something. So um, I think it's a, a something that I still struggle with, to be honest. So one of the things that I've found uh, extremely surprising is when you are quoted in the paper. <laughs> 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 so one time um, I had one of the mayors of the city of Richmond <clears throat> to tell me that um, he wasn't going to let 
anything get done in my district. That it was just off limits, it wasn't gonna happen. And I said, uh, well, I think most of the folk in my district still pay taxes, so how do, we, how do you justify that? And so I said, well, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna ho hold a press conference and I'm going to announce that I'm going to send out a message to all our taxpayers that we're going to, because the only thing I really know really well is housing. So I said, uh, we're gonna get all the taxpayers to put all their monies into a uh, escrow account so we can take care of our own services. We don't need the mayor <laughs> 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 to pay. <clears throat> so the mayor got really ticked off by that. <laughs> and um, he made some, he said some things and I said some things and then the, <laughs> And then the next day in the paper, um, I was quoted as said that I was going to take a gun and shoot the mayor. <laughs> so quite embarrassing. Uh, it took a lot of radio and public apologies and all kinds of stuff to get myself out of there. But that's not exactly what I said, you know. <laughs> Yeah, the, the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the one that comes to mind to me, again, another Capital One story back in the uh, days of the Citrus Bowl, uh, now the Capital One Bowl, right? And um, I, we, we used to kind of trade off and we'd have an executive kind of go and be the Cap One representative each year. And it was my year, I was very excited. And um, you'd got to do a variety of different things. One of them was you got to award the trophy to the winner at the end of the game. So this was Tennessee, Michigan, and Tennessee won. And um, so, and the name of this trophy was, and I don't remember it, but it was like five names long. The yada yada, huda huda, wada wada, you know, trophy. And so I was, I was really nervous about getting it right. So I had written, I got a little piece of paper that I've got in my hand, and, and I got it written there, and I keep reading it over and over and practice it in my head, in my head, in my head. And so time comes, and they've got a riser set up like this, um, uh, pretty small, and they've got the entire football team uh, around us, and they've got, I think, a woman from ABC, you know, the sponsor of the event, and then me, uh, and then they've got the coach who's gonna come up. So we, you know, we all come up. So first of all, these guys are really excited, right? And they're really huge, they're huge, <laughs> and they really smell bad. <laughs> and I'm serious. And it was distracting. <laughs> and um, so I get up there, and, and then they hand me the trophy. And the trophy's like 35 pounds. And, but I'm like, OK, I got it. I got it. And I read the trophy name perfectly, and then got the coach's name wrong. <laughs> right? And as soon as it got out, out of my mouth, the woman from ABC looks at me like, I can't believe you just did that. <laughs> and you know how in a stadium there's a delay? and you hear it over and over <laughs> and over again. And so um, next day in the paper, thank you for the paper, right? Uh, we got slammed for having such an inept executive uh, uh, um, represent us. So that was, yeah, that was, that was a, a little bit painful, but kind of funny. Uh, uh, so. Wow, those are some stories. Um, <laughs> I've not been misquoted to either of those. <laughs> um, OK, so I have two questions, if people will hang in. One is a little bit what we just talked about. I, I had a couple questions about, hey, there are a lot of people who are not really, especially in politics, not working for the people. And how do you stay optimistic? And the other question was like, hey, when you like work with somebody and they're not very respectful, how do you maintain your confidence? So you guys shared kind of things that maybe didn't go so well. How do you? quickly, quick tip for your perspective on maintaining confidence and how you move on from those things. Uh, I, what gives me peace at night is um, if I worked as hard as I can throughout the day, even if I make mistakes, as long as I've given the day sort of what I can, there's nothing more that I could have done. So um, that's... That's, I sort of just like tell myself that to, to make myself go to bed. Um, but I think it's important because you are going to make mistakes and um, people are going to get mad and you might have a misstep. And I, I think that's part of being human. And so um, I don't know. That's how I. And I think um, Marge, 
I definitely agree with you on the um, the future of this country. I think um, Richmond had a 70% voter turnout, um, which is hugely above the national average. Um, we have a record number of young people running for office, a record number of minorities, a record number of people of color, the first transgender um, elected official at the state level. Um, I had to create my own maternity leave policy at school board because there hadn't been a woman that had a baby on school board. Um, but now there is one, right? And that's awesome. So um, you should totally run, and we can help. <laughs> um, but I, um, I think, you know, for me, some of the issues that I care about, um, I think, I think we're seeing a, a real um, change, and I think for the better that people have woken up. I feel like two years ago, and I'm a huge political junkie. Nobody wanted to talk to me about politics, and like now, it's like, can we please not talk about politics? I just want to talk about dogs or cats. I'm going to turn that one a little bit because I think we Caritas. Uh, was one of the top workplaces again this year for the third year in a row and the only nonprofit that wasn't a, a school. So we're really proud of that. But I think what we've learned about that, not just about you know my situation, but it's managing your staff and managing situations that come up. And I think for, for a long time, when you have a problem child, you wanna kind of move them from here to here to here and try to manage it. And I've gotten to the point in my wisdom and my experience from doing this is, a, it, sooner rather than later to cut bait. And it's just, if it's not a fit for your culture of your organization, just make it go away. It's just, it's the right thing to do for your organization, for the people that you work with, and um, it'll serve you well in the end. Okay. All right, last question. You can incorporate the prior in this if you want to. Um, if you could give your younger self advice today, what would that be? I love this question. You should ask it to everybody you know. <laughs> so, you know, for me, and I actually, I enjoyed this question because it really made me think about a, a funny, funny time. Um, so what I would say is trust your team, right? We work at kind of building team capabilities. I think, again, as leaders, a lot of times we, we don't disengage enough and really empower our teams and trust them. And I, I learned this so clearly. Um, about 15 years ago, uh, Julie and I were hiking the Inca Trail. Um, but it was during a, a, a tough time, and Judy, I think you were a big part of this at Capital One, we were having to close our site in Tampa. And this was the first time that we had ever done anything like that. Now, keep in mind, again, this was, what, about 15 years ago, probably. So this was pre-cell phone days, except for, um, you know, things that were about, like, a brick, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, th and that was even worse when you needed a satellite phone. But I was sure, I was sure that my team could not live without me mm -hmm. while Julie and I hink hiked the Inca Trail. So I put an additional 15 pounds in my backpack with a satellite phone and found myself trying to call in to conference calls. And literally, I am standing in a mountain meadow with alpacas searching for a satellite signal. This is the truth. And it, it was just so dumb, right? <laughs> just so daft. Um, but it, it took uh, some pretty aching shoulders for me to catch on that, you know what? They don't need me. That's a good thing. Thanks. I would say, you know, along lines that of, of all the things that we've talked about today, but um, I would say don't second guess yourself and know that, you know, you're pretty, you're pretty intuitive and, um, you know, just don't second guess yourself. Just give yourself the, the, enough rope and it'll, walk, it'll go one way or another, but. <laughs> all right, advice to younger self. Uh, younger self. Um, I was watching a program and Michelle Obama was one of the guests. And I share this with many folk that I come in contact with. Matter of fact, I shared this even with uh, the superintendent of school recently. Uh, young man has taken on a huge, huge responsibility um, with the city of Richmond, uh, but I've shared it with lots of folks. And what she said is that at the beginning of the year, and this is what I would tell myself 
to do differently throughout my life. Um, that she and Barack would take a calendar and they would put on the calendar everything that they were going to do for the year for the children. You know, their doctor's appointments, their games, their school events, their whatever. Whatever were things that they really had mapped out and planned for their children. And then they would put on that same calendar what things they plan to do for themselves as a couple. And then each of them would put on things that were special to them individually, and then everything else was fit in after that. And they made a commitment to each other that they would stick to that calendar. And I think sometimes in our world of career and career development, it becomes our total life. And in the process, we lose out on those real opportunities to know ourselves, to enjoy ourselves, to experience all of those great things that are about ourselves. You know, some of the questions that have been asked of us today are questions that we should be asking of ourselves all the time. I mean, we're fabulous people. We really, really are. And there's just so much great stuff about all of us that we sometimes miss it when we don't take that time to really put family and to put those persons that are significantly important to us on our calendar and not let, you know, city council meeting that stays up 24 hours to do a budget that end up moving less than 1.5% of the budget around uh, dominate your time. And so I, I was so pleased to hear her say that and I share that with Benny because I think the more we try to do that, you know, uh, I think we will begin to realize how great, how great a life we have. That's what I would tell my younger self if I was smarter then. <laughs> That's a real tough fact to follow. Um, uh, I was going to say something uh, along the lines of work-life balance because I'm feeling that struggle right now. Um, uh, but um, to offer a different perspective, um, this is totally random, but I've been really frustrated with women saying that they're bad at math. Can we just stop saying we're bad at math? Like, just stop. Like, I love math. It took me, um, I like, it took me a long time to realize that I loved math and be comfortable with saying that. I, but now I have this like knee-jerk reaction. I'm around women all the time in startups that are like, I need someone to do my math for me. It's like, no, you can do your math for you. You don't have to be an expert, but like, why do men own math? I don't know. It's just stupid. So anyways, <laughs> embrace math. Good piece of advice. All right, good. Thank you guys so much. I, I certainly learned a lot today. And we're going to let Linda wrap up, and then people are going to stay if you want to come up and talk to someone. Okay, I don't suck at math, but I hate math, so. <laughs> but Embrace I hate math. I'm embracing it, I'm embracing it. Um, so first of all, thank you all. Weren't they amazing? I mean, yeah. really. And they will stick around for a little bit um, if anyone has, wants to come up and, and ask questions afterwards. I also really wanna thank Judy uh, for being our um, our moderator again and doing it so well, and her team from Capital One. I can't thank Capital One enough for doing this, so thank you. So every year um, as we wrap up this breakfast, we really try to think of a gift that would be meaningful that would be a gift to the YWCA in honor of all of you women who have done such an extraordinary job today. And this year, what we really, really need at the YWCA um, are gift cards for our survivors of domestic and sexual violence. And so on, in your honor, we are giving this tree of hope uh, to the YWCA these are 12 gift cards that are valued at about $10 to $15 a piece from Kroger, Subway, Walmart, Target, things like that, so that our survivors can receive a little bit of hope themselves in that they can get their next meal, 
their next tank of gas, or their next bag of groceries for their family, especially for survivors who are coming into our shelter. And so I just wanted to thank you on behalf of everyone at the YWCA. We're gonna present this to our case management team who works with our survivors, um, but it's really in your honor that we're gifting this to them. So thank you so much. So thank you all again for being here today. We loved having you, and we hope we'll see you back next year. Thank you so much. We're great. We're going to have